as you know, we have seven uh, research networks and each research network, I suppose, pursues the, um, you know, the, the opportunities, the policies, the possibilities around uh, adult education, lifelong learning in their own sectors, but also across the sectors. So, you know, to have joined up thinking. But I suppose what we're really trying to do is we are trying to engage in research to see what is best practice, to see uh, what ways uh, we can do this better, also to influence policy, to give policymakers a better sense of what's working in different countries or what might work and and and, and so on and so forth. Um, because you know, policymakers are trying to do the same thing that we're trying to do, really. They're trying to create opportunities and we can provide them with um, research, data uh, and studies and so on and so forth that can help them in, in, in doing that. And I suppose it's also important that universities as public uh, sector organizations that they um that they make a contribution to wider society so like the most recent um research network is around non-formal informal learning and civil society so uh, non-formal and informal learning and civil society organizations have a critical role in creating a eco an ecosystem uh which enables all learners and then we have a, a cross-cutting issue as well around the education of girls and women. And uh, this is really, really important. And uh, I'm hoping that we will get a little bit more energy into that. And at our meeting earlier this week, we spoke about that. And uh, it looks like uh, Research Network uh, 4, in collaboration with Research Network 5, will be able to do something exciting in that space uh, before too long to, um, you know, to, to really to start to articulate the challenges and the opportunities and to ensure that girls and women have the same opportunities as boys and men in the education system everywhere in the ASIM community and globally. Where lifelong learning is critically, critically important in terms of um, assisting people, giving people the tools, uh, the critiques, the an analytical skills, the understandings to address all of these challenges. because. As a global community, we have to we have to address these things together. No one country, no matter how big or powerful it is, can deal with everything on its own. It doesn't matter where you live. If you lived uh, in a remote part of the Amazon rainforest in a small group, the world is changing around you, whether you can want to or not. Um, whether you're living in, you know, Singapore or you're living in, you know, Paris, Things are constantly changing. They're constantly, you know, everything is constantly in flux, uh, politically and socially and technologically. And uh, we mentioned climate and all kinds of things are constantly changing. And we can only really deal with that kind of constant change if we are cognitively flexible. And lifelong learning is critically important in helping individuals and wider society to stay cognitively flexible. And being cognitively flexible means that we don't look at things from a fixed point of view, that we don't come to things with saying, I already know. And this is how it is. I was in a European country a few years ago and we were looking at statistics around uh, lifelong learning. And uh, I'm, I'm looking at, at the figures and um, I then asked the question, I said, any question? And I said, uh, does everybody in this country die at 65? And I said, sorry, why are you asking that question? I said, your statistics only go to 65. Does everybody die at 65? <laughs> and it's crazy. It's completely crazy. Oh. I was at a presentation in in asia as it happened and uh, the person was talking about their country and they were talking about the number of people who were engaged in lifelong learning and they gave a figure i can't remember what the figure was so i said look i'm sorry but your figures are wrong and they looked and said no our figures are not wrong you know i said absolutely they're wrong and they said why, why did you say that because i said the number of people engaged in lifelong learning in your country is 100%.
human beings are learning all the time. We never stop learning. I mean, we, we, we never. So when we start talking about lifelong learning, we have to acknowledge that those kind of facts. People don't stop at 65 and everybody is learning all of the time. If somebody gets a new phone, if you put a new doorbell on your door, if you get a new electric kettle, a new coffee maker, a new frying pan, a new pair of shoes, mm -hmm. a new car, everything, you have to learn something about how to use that. Definitely. So it doesn't matter where you are or who you are or what you are. You are constantly learning. Yeah, <laughs> There's yeah. always new things coming your way. It's so wonderful. we're always lifelong learners. And like that's that's where we need to get to, to understand that yeah. that's what we need to be helping people that in in that lifelong learning journey that they're that we're creating things that really add value to them in terms of what they're learning that's what the asm lifelong learning hub can really do for the whole asm project is to give the whole project a better sense of the possibilities that reside in lifelong learning but look it's for everybody uh, university education should be for everybody who has a an ambition to pursue higher level education. And what impact specifically, if, if you can give a visualization of the impact of lifelong education, of the researches that ASIM lifelong learning is provided to is providing to the world, what impact would it bring to our society? Like a visualization of it. Yeah, you know, you're 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 touching on something uh, really important there. I mean a few different things, I suppose, but like one one thing that um you know, for people to to sort of realize is that um, I have a colleague in the U.S. and they, in the U.S. to talk about um, uh, Generation uh, Zero. Uh, this is when people come to the country for the first time. And very often uh, people arrive in a country for, you know, the first time as a refugee or an asylum seeker or whatever. And very often they they don't have much of a stake in the society. They find it hard to get jobs and, uh, you know, education and all the other things that people need to get on with their lives and um, lifelong learning in that context is really really important because it gives them opportunities to uh, re-establish their families their lives their futures their hopes uh, and you know go new places with it so I think you know um, we often underestimate how really, really, really important all of that is because it can it can ch change the dynamic in a family. It can change the dynamic for the siblings, for the parents, the children, but it also impacts and has a fundamental change effect in the wider community, the wider society which those people engage in. So I, I, I know I'm maybe idealistic and, and naive, but if all of us set out to try and make the world better for everybody that we encounter, we would have an awful lot better world. Um, would that would that describe our researchers? Because we are, I mean, not, not really we, but the researchers of ASM, they are the one who actually come up with policies and advices and practices for lifelong learning would that actually describe our researchers yeah but i suppose it's important to realize that what what today uh makes sense tomorrow the world will have changed a little bit so nothing is fixed and certain and i wouldn't like our researchers to be overly definitive in terms of their findings um what we we discover things that indicate uh, and demonstrate certain trends, um, demonstrate certain ways in which we could and should go and how we can do things better. But that doesn't mean we've reached the end point. Um, you know, so it's always open to further discussion and further debate and further research and further refinement um, because the world is constantly changing. So I think all researchers have to have an open mind. They have to be open to unexpected uh, outcomes of their research. Uh, they, you know, should not be going in with preconceived ideas of where where this is and what the answer is. You you may have an idea about it, but you should be open to 
um, persuasion and you should be open to analyzing uh, the data that's presented to you uh, uh, and to analyze it in an, an open uh, way and be prepared to accept that, yeah, maybe maybe it's not right. And uh, maybe there's another way of looking at this and there are other possibilities. Um, I was uh, listening to um, an interview with a uh, um, a surgeon, I think I, 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 can't, I think it was to do with the eyes, but they were talking about how um, AI could uh, analyze uh, the eye in a way, you know, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of uh, images that have been captured by uh, physicians, you know, over the past while and can analyze all of these the hundreds and thousands of these uh, in a way that a surgeon, you know, no matter how experienced they are, couldn't could never do. So I think I think this is this is really really important, uh, and this is one of the things I suppose that AI is going to be able to do for us. It's going to be able to uh, give us a level of analysis of uh, things like uh, you know um, big data of all kinds uh, in a way that we didn't have up to now. So that's it is going to provide us with a lot of useful useful new ways of analyzing and doing things, and we are going to make new discoveries. No question about that. Uh, I'm, I, I can't remember how many times I changed my career, but I changed my career a lot of times. And I'm certain you will change your career a lot of times. And there, you know, maybe in 25 years, you are doing a job that there's no title for now. There's no concept that it will exist. There will be a uh, but the world will change, create uh, opportunities, and you'll be in, in this new uh, role somewhere. Um, and, you know, so that that's that, that's for sure. But I think once once you yourself uh, stay as an active lifelong learner, which I'm sure you will, <laughs> um, then you you stay abreast of changes and opportunities and so on and so forth, and you can you can you can navigate uh, the world in a better way. And I think that's I mean that's really what we try to do for people. We try to help them to navigate the the changes in the world. What disturbs me a little bit is that more and more people seem to be articulating a fixed view of the world. We hate all X. Uh, we hate all Y. Uh, we don't like you know, people because of their gender. We don't like people because of the color of their skin. We don't like people because of the language they speak. We don't like people because of their religion. You know, like, what is that about? Uh, how does that benefit anybody? Um, and it's, it's, it's kind of a, it's, it's, it's kind of a collective delusion. And I think this is where lifelong learning really has an important role to play, to help people to escape from the shackles of seeing the world in such binary and divisive and destructive ways, mm -hmm. and to begin to see the world with all the wonderful possibilities that exist in it. I think maybe uh, people in Asia don't quite realize how dynamic and how innovative a lot of what's happening there is. Certain Europeans don't quite realize it. So, I mean, I, I mentioned two projects that I saw uh, in particular. To, to, there are hundreds of thousands of these kinds of projects, uh, one in, in Thailand and one in the Philippines. These were community education projects, and they were dealing with all ages. They were dealing with little kids, uh, toddlers, uh, Parents, grandparents, uh, old people, young people, everybody in between. And everybody was involved in those projects. Everybody was um, contributing. Everybody was learning. All of the societies, all of the communities they were living in were directly benefiting from their collective learning together. So what I think is important is that we create the opportunities that spotlights are shone upon these really outstanding examples of good practice mm. and that governments begin to appreciate more really what's happening in their own societies in terms of creating resilience creating opportunities around work around social life around the quality of life about people living good fruitful flourishing lives um i think that's really 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 important if if you go and persuade the Asians, for example, how would you build 
the trust? How do you build a foundation of trust? And better yet, to build a partnership with them. Uh, how would you do it? Yeah, look, I suppose, I mean, um, the old saying, Rome wasn't built in a day. So we have to uh, continue to talk to people and engage with people and demonstrate that, um, you know, that lifelong learning is really about change. It's about resilience. It's about giving people coping mechanisms. It's about people being able to live better and longer lives. It improves people's health. It improves their outlook in the world. Uh, it gives them opportunities that they wouldn't otherwise have. And that's really, really important. It applies to everybody. So it's not, we, we have to, of course, persuade policymakers. We also have to persuade educators. I have a little painting here in my house um, that my mother did. She started to paint, I'd say, when she was at least in her 80s. She had never, she never, I mean, she painted doors and windows and gates, <laughs> but she didn't do any artistic painting no right throughout her entire life. And I wonder if she decided to pick up a brush and... Well, I think she went to a daycare center and they were, they were doing art. And she said, well, That's why not? And, it and then she did, it's a beautiful picture. It's one of my favorite pictures. Um, of course, it's not going to be hanging in the Louvre. I understand that. But... It has meaning. It has meaning for her. It has meaning for me. And I can see, you know, what she was achieving in, in this. And I can see her in that picture. So we can learn all throughout our lives. And I think it was um, Bertolt Brecht who said that, you know, we, we can begin again and we can begin again right up to our final breath. And... He's absolutely right.